In this lecture, we will be discussing Chapter 3 in your reimbursement textbook. We will be discussing some more generic terms to all healthcare plans, and the bulk of this chapter, we will be discussing voluntary healthcare insurance plans, what that means. Voluntary health insurance is basically the umbrella term that includes all of our private and or commercial health care plans. It also includes all of our Blue Cross Blue Shield plans in the U.S. So those payments from those voluntary plans account for about 35% of all health care expenditures in the United States. So a pretty big chunk. Some of voluntary health insurance, which we'll get into here in a minute, is related to employment. Some of it is not. So we'll talk about those differences in this chapter as well. But what voluntary health insurance is not, it is not a social health insurance. It is not a government program. We'll have many chapters as we get later into the textbook that are devoted to each government health insurance program. It is also not a public welfare insurance. Prior to the 1970s, almost all voluntary health insurance was what we call an indemnity. Indemnity health insurance plans, we can also refer to those as retrospective or fee for service. So we had the service and then our payment is after, or retro. And that was talked about in Chapter 1. So if you need to go back and, and review that, please go ahead and do so. In indemnity plans, the health insurance company basically, they pay a predetermined percent of the health care services, a percent of that cost. And the guarantor would then pay the remaining percentage. The guarantor meaning the holder of the account, who's responsible for the account. Now, with indemnity, they do offer patients or people on the plan the freedom to choose their health care professional. So that's a, a great thing about indemnity voluntary health insurance plans. In this chapter, we are really going to look at the two main categories of voluntary health insurance. We have private or commercial insurance plans, and then we have our Blue Cross excuse me, Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans. So we'll dive into each of those and, and talk about that as we get further into the chapter. Commercial health insurance plans historically have, have been in place to for profit or to make money. The majority of those are employer-based. So if your employer offers health insurance, that would be an example of that. Blue Cross Blue Shield plans were historically not for profit. The majority of those have changed to for profit. Not all, but I would say the majority. And some terms discussed in your book um, that are not specifically on this PowerPoint. Um, our risk pool is one. Basically, a risk pool is a group or an individual. However your insurance company is lumping you with other individuals, employers, associations. So they look at all the individuals, if it's related to employment, for example, in your organization, and they look at the risk. Some people will be healthy. Some people will not. Their hope is that the risk is less, that they'll make more money, that the majority of the people are healthy, but really the risk pool looks at, we know some people will use a lot of services, and we know some people will never use healthcare services or use their insurance. So the goal or the hope is that those will balance out and at least that they will break even. Another term in this chapter is premium. Most of you probably know what that is if you have health insurance you are paying a premium. This is what you have to pay monthly, usually, maybe every six months, every year, depending upon what type of plan you're on. But this is basically the amount 
that you have to pay periodically in order to have your health insurance. In Chapter 3, there really is some terms that may be confusing. You may have heard used differently throughout your experience with health care. The word private is used two ways, basically, in the health insurance industry. First, the term is sometimes used as a synonym for commercial health insurance. Secondly, that term can also be used to to indicate that health insurance is purchased by an individual instead of purchased by an employer or a group of employees. Commercial health insurance plans and those Blue Cross Blue Shield plans often have multiple divisions, multiple options, both to an individual and to an employer. So though that can be confusing as well. The word individual in our text really means non-group. So you're not associated with a specific employer, that kind of thing. It can also mean no dependents. So you are on a single plan. So those can, can really get confusing. There are two types of private health insurance plans that we'll talk about in Chapter 3. Private meaning the individual is going out and purchasing a health insurance plan um, for the family or for themselves. A good example of this would be someone who is self-employed um, in any business. Basically, they don't have it through a group. They don't have it through employee, their employment. They don't have any kind of state program. So the risk really is whoever they're insuring. So is it yourself? Maybe you're going out and getting a plan for yourself or for you and your family. And then if you do so, you will have to fill out a health questionnaire. They may request some past medical records because, remember, risk pool looks at how risky is it, how much are you going to cost us. If you have a chronic condition or you've had a lot of medical problems, they may charge you more. And individual insurance is generally more expensive because that risk pool is so small. The second type is employer-based. This is um, what a lot of people look for when they want to get a job because it is cheaper. The risk pool is all employees. So if you go and you are employed at a very large hospital, maybe that has 10,000 employees, that risk pool is very large. So generally the costs go down because, again, they think some people are healthy, some people are not. We hope it will even out or at least that will maybe hopefully make some money. A little more about private or individual plans. Again, this is for generally individuals or self-employed uh, business persons that want to go out and purchase insurance for themselves, for their family. The covered services may be different each plan. If you want more services, generally you're paying more in your premium every single month. Each of those plans may have different provisions. They may have different deductibles. A deductible, again, is what you must pay before the health insurance company will step in and start making payments for your services. They may look at pre-existing conditions. If you have chronic conditions, we'll talk more about some of the new legislation in a little bit. But um, those may be provisions in the individual plans. Employer-based or group health insurance. These are basically plans for groups of employees or members. Just as the name um, sounds, your employment is tied to your health insurance. If you leave your employment, you lose your health insurance. So employer-based Plans, generally, we are going to see lower premiums, what we pay every month, every quarter, however the plan is set up. Those are going to be lower. Generally, our deductibles lower. Again, that risk pool is bigger, so the cost can go down. Our Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans, these are the second major category and the third classification of voluntary health insurance. So they are really a big chunk of 
the health insurance in the United States. The Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, they started in Dallas, Texas in 1929. They have really, really been around a long time. They began as a plan for school teachers in the state of Texas. And as, as you probably have heard, Blue Cross plans, they have spread throughout the U.S. at really a, a very fast pace. And I think they'll probably continue to grow through the years as well. And this slide just contains some more history on Blue Cross Blue Shield. You can um, read that in your textbook as well. I won't cover all the history because you can go and review those two slides on your own. Blue Cross and Blue Shield, they have two types of accounts. Um, geographic plans are at the regional, state, and sub-state level. And then we have the federal employee program. Geographic plan covers members in a certain specific geographic region, a state, an area of a state, and the FEP that covers all enrolled federal government employees across the nation. So that's really a, a big chunk. Again, these two programs are covered more in your textbook. If you want to um, spend some more time on that, that would be great. State health care plans for someone who is medically uninsurable. State laws have been passed trying to help people that are uninsurable. And this is not, um, these people are, they can't get a group plan, but they also are not eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. So I think that's kind of the confusing part of the state plans. Basically, people eligible for or state health insurance plans don't have access to health care in the usual ways that we think of when we think of health insurance. Persons who are eligible for our state health insurance plans, they do have financial resources, but for medical reasons, they are unable to go out and get health insurance. State funds for these health insurance plans are through premiums to pay for the costs that go in excess of what they're taking in for the premiums. The state will use various methods, uh, maybe general funds from tax revenues, fees charged to the health insurance companies in that state, or maybe even tobacco tax revenues. At any one time, about 200,000 people in the U.S. are covered under Health, the statewide health insurance plans. Because it is a state program, state law will determine what the benefits are, what will be covered, um, who is eligible, what the premiums are, and all other provisions that go along with the plans. Now we're going to discuss some terms that are generic to most insurance companies. Health insurance policy is basically a formal contract between the insurance company and the in individual or the group who is taking that risk. So we have payments of insured under a policy. We have different covered conditions. So basically that means what are they going to pay and what are they going to not pay. Do you have coverage to have a baby? that kind of thing. That would be a covered condition or a not covered condition. The certificate holder or the su subscriber, this is the person who is carrying the plan, the subscriber. Generally, the husband, not always, if it's linked to employment, maybe the wife has in group insurance through her employer, then she would be subs the subscriber. The certificate number, that's basically just the number assigned to each individual subscriber. That used to be a lot of times the social security number. Most insurance companies have moved away from that and are just using um, a different number that is not linked to the social security number. Some of the plans may have a dependent. A dependent is basically adding someone to the insurance beyond the initial subscriber. We already discussed what premiums are. 
the premium amount will depend largely on if it's single coverage or family coverage. Obviously, family will be much more expensive. A deductible is, like we talked about, the amount that you must pay before the insurance company will step, up, step in and, and pay. Coinsurance, this is the percent that the insurance company pays and that the patient or the subscriber pays. So if your health insurance plan says we'll pay 80% or it's an 80-20 plan, for example, that means they will pick up 80% coinsurance and you'll pick up 20% coinsurance, generally after the deductible has been met. A copayment. Coinsurance and copayment I get I see get confused a lot by students, so really make sure you understand those two terms. Coinsurance, if you think of the percent, copayment is generally what you see when you go to an office visit. You may have a $20 copay before they'll pay um, a percent of that office visit. Sometimes the coinsurance does not apply to office visits. You may just have a copayment, but that will be a set dollar amount that you pay for that service. Generally, you'll see that, like I said, in office visits. You may have a $20 copay. That's all you'll pay for an office visit. You will have a plan number on all insurance that may be linked to a group. It may be just an individual, but that identifies your coverage. Each insurance company will have a policy that lets the patient, the subscriber, know what's covered what's not covered as a medical service. That will be different for all insurance companies. Some are very good about preventative care, about covering physicals, colonoscopies, those type of preventative services. With the new legislation that we'll talk about at the end of the chapter, um, really, I think we'll see more and more preventative services being covered. I think insurance companies in general are finally figuring out it's cheaper to treat a condition that's caught early. So for example, if a patient had a mammogram it, and found a lump, it's much cheaper to have a, a lumpectomy than if the patient waited, did not have the preventative service, maybe has to have a double mastectomy, chemotherapy, radiation, that kind of thing. So I think we'll see more and more preventative things being covered as we go forward. Health insurance policies are split up into sections. Typically, those include definitions. Commonly, that's called terms, the terms of the policy. Eligibility and enrollment. What are the benefits? What are they going to pay for? The limitations. What will they not pay for? What's your coinsurance? What's your copayment? What's your cap? The most will pay on this plan in a lifetime of having the plan. What are the exclusions of the plan? What will we absolutely not cover? Is there any riders? Any endorsements? This is just an example from a prescription drug benefit. So you can see we have uh, what are we going to, what will we as a patient or as a sub subscriber pay for generic drugs? Uh, non-generic brand name drugs and that amount of supply per day. So that's an example of a, a limitation. Some other sections of a policy include the procedures. How do you have to obtain prior approval, say for a planned surgery? Do you have to call and get that approved? Can you just present and have the service? Coordination of benefits means if you have more than one insurance, who will pay first? Who will pay second? Our primary payer is the health insurance company that's responsible for the majority of those health expenses. Um, if there is another insurance that the patient is covered, that would be the secondary insurance that would pick up the expenses. If the patient has Medicaid, and another insurance, Medicaid is what we call the payer of last resort. 
Medicaid is always billed and pays after all other plans have been billed, have paid, and everything else has been exhausted. So that's just one thing to um, just remember. Um, if it is a child that is covered by, say, mom and dad's insurance plan, that is what we call the birthday rule. So let me back up a little bit. If mom and dad both have insurance and they both cover themselves and the family, if mom goes to the doctor, her plan will be the primary or the first payer, and then the husband's or dad's policy will be the secondary. That will pay what's left. And the same for dad. His own plan will be primary. The wife's will be secondary. So, like I said, the children, it applies to a birthday rule. It isn't just dad's plan is primary or whoever has the better plan is primary. It goes by the birthday rule when both parents have coverage on the children. So they look at whose birthday comes first in the calendar year. So take out the, the year mom and dad were born. Don't look at that at all. Look at the day and the month. If mom was born January 2nd, dad was born January 30th because mom's birthday falls first in a year, she is the primary insurer for the children. Her insurance company should be billed first. The appeals process, this basically, what will you do? You're not happy with what was paid in your claim. Maybe the claim was rejected. How can you go about as the subscriber or the patient to appeal that process? Each insurance plan will determine what's a covered service and what's not a covered service. Um, such things as mental health benefits, chemical dependency benefits, those are things that each insurance company has to decide what's our definition of it, what's our limitations, what are we excluding? That sort of thing. I think this, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this chart really is an example of the determination. So, what is our definition? What are our limitations? What are we excluding? And what's our procedure? Do you have to have prior approval? Do you have to call us and get the okay first? Maybe we want you, as the insurance company, to go somewhere and have it done some specific place, some specific provider. Each subscriber will get a health insurance card. If you've had insurance or have seen insurance cards, some of those can be very confusing for a hospital or a clinic to set up in their system. Some of them I've seen have four different addresses on them. This is an example of a, a pretty clean one, I guess I would say. Um, and generally, there's information on the back as well, but they will include the subscriber name, the unique identifier for that subscriber. You can see here it's EDQ, and then that's the ID that uniquely identifies that subscriber with this plan. You can see this patient is on a group plan. We have a group number, what date it was issued. We can see that we have a $12 copay on our generic refills. Um, we can see that in network, our, if we go to a primary provider, we're going to pay $30 for the patient. That is our copayment amount. And our coinsurance is 8020. If you see options, it says standard 8020. That's our coinsurance. They're going to pay 80. We're going to pay 20. Submitting a health insurance claim, basically claim submission is the process of transmitting claims data to our payers, to the health insurance companies for payment. So basically when we submit a claim, and that generally happens electronically in 99% of cases, we are requesting payment for services. So this is really where our coding comes into play for those of you that want to be coders. It is critical that the codes are all supported. So if I have a procedure code of um, an appendectomy 
I had better have a diagnosis code that matches that instead of a code that maybe is for an ear infection. That would automatically be kicked out of the system. So really, that, like I said, is, is where our, our claims come into play. Even I've seen insurance companies reject claims for a middle initial that's incorrect. Maybe the receptionist put a K instead of a J on the keyboard. So any little tiny thing that's incorrect, generally, when it gets to the insurance company's electronic end, they have edits, scrubbers, that will check it automatically. Any errors, it will bounce back as non-paid. Like I said, most of these happen um, automatically. A clean claim is what we want. That basically means it's free of errors and it is complete. That's what we want because it speeds up reimbursement. If it's a dirty claim, obviously something is wrong with it. It's inaccurate, it's incomplete, it's defective. So that means it goes back and we have to start over. That means our money is held up. So we really want to get clean claims the first time. Adjudication, that's the determination of reimbursement based on the insurance benefit. So they match your plan up, what's covered, what percent, and what's your deductible, have you met it, have you not, and then hopefully they will make payment. Some common errors that providers make when they are submitting claims, differences in the patient name or the patient spelling. Maybe the patient goes by their middle name, but that's not their, their full name. That's not going to be the name on the insurance card. Maybe it's a nickname they go by. Maybe they have a hyphenated last name. The hyphen's left out on the provider's end. Um, also, they could be missing patient information or the identification number is invalid. Maybe it was typed wrong. We're all human. Errors do happen. Um, they may be missing information um, or it may be inaccurate. Maybe the patient's a female and they put in they check the mail in error again that can happen so basically any of those of those things can happen also payers can can make mistakes on their end and the insurance companies and that can happen as well maybe um, I know when I changed insurances recently I got my paperwork back and my cards and I was set to go and my birth date was four years off and it took me three four months to fix my own birth date as the subscriber and in the meantime they would not pay any of my claims because my hospital had the correct date of birth my insurance company had the incorrect date of birth so any claim that they got automatically bounced back with an error so it's important to get those those items correct um, up front to delay um, and not only for the hospital, but for the patient as well. It's very frustrating. So in an ideal world, we're going to get reimbursed. That generally will come in electronic fund transfer. The, pay, the payment basically is, is electronically sent to the provider's bank. Generally, hospitals work with the same insurance companies over and over again. So they have this all set up in their system and it automatically goes and then what they'll get is an electronic remittance advice or an RA and that basically is a report sent by the insurance company it lists what did we pay what did we reject why did we reject it uh, basically the patient gets the same thing but we call that an EOB so it's uh, just different terms for basically the same thing an RA is what goes to the provider. An EOB is what goes to the patient. So if you've had health insurance and you get the statement that says you went to the doctor on January 1st, you went to Dr. Joe Smith, you had um, an E&M level, an office visit, you also had a strep test, and you had a chest x-ray. These were your diagnosis. Some of those things are not all on all of them but generally they'll have um, the essential same elements where did you go when did you go what did we pay 
I personally like when they include CPT codes and ICD-9 codes because I am a coder and I like to see that they were built correctly and I have caught things that were coded incorrectly before and when you call your hospital as a coder and tell them that there's an error that doesn't always go so well. They don't like generally when <laughs> most of them when you call and you actually know what you're talking about and you can catch errors but it's important that you you know as as a health professional look at those things because there is errors and and you could save yourself your family um, some, some money maybe something was rejected or denied that shouldn't have been so these are what what's on an RA or an EOB like I said your name the provider name the date what was the charge what did we allow what did we write off what are you responsible for Some new trends we've heard about and seen in healthcare are really having some big impacts on healthcare. The ACA or the Affordable Care Act, um, some provisions went into place in 2010. One of those was coverage for young adults. Um, basically, it was getting harder and harder to find for young people to graduate from college or maybe just out of high school to get a job with insurance. So now, young adults can remain on their parents plan until they reach the age of 26. The next is pre-existing conditions. Um, this is a really complex rule. Basically the ACA eliminates pre-existing conditions as barriers to purchasing health care. So um, that really was a big obstacle for someone with a long-term condition. They're expensive. Insurance companies don't want to always pay for those services. So that was part of that as well. Um, preventative care, like I talked about before. Um, it, the ACA now requires all new group and individual plans to provide free preventative care for preventative services and immunizations. Again, I, I'm, I still see in here some insurance companies are kind of finding loopholes in that, but um, I think that will kind of tighten up as time goes as well. The other there, other provisions of the ACA also protect consumers. That was kind of the whole um, thought behind this act. Health insurance companies cannot cancel your plan when you get sick. Say you get cancer before, they could just dump you. Now they cannot. So some very good things went into effect in 2010. Provisions also of the ACA that went into effect <clears throat> excuse me, in 2011 was the CLASS Act, which stands for Community Living Assistance Services and Support. This basically established a national voluntary health insurance program for purchasing community living assistance and support. This is... Um, a great example of, again, protecting the patients. Examples of those services include long-term housing, um, technologies that would assist the patient in their care. Unfortunately, the Department of Health and Human Services halted efforts to implement the CLASS program at the moment. Hopefully, I think we'll see that probably go forward, but um, for the time being, that is halted. In 2012, um, we talked about this about the 2010 enactments, but preventative health services extended the list of women's preventative health services. And the 2014, that affected voluntary excuse me, health insurance plans in 2014. This requires most U.S. citizens and legal residents to have health insurance beginning in 2014. What's going to happen in 2015 and beyond? This may all change, but um, we think by 2018, health care insurers with high annual premiums will have to pay an excise tax. That's okay. The thresholds for high premiums would be $10,000 for individual, 
27500 for family coverage. That's really a lot of money for someone to have to pay for a premium. Again, that may all change. That's just um, kind of up in the air at this point. What are we going to see in the future? Um, probably, unfortunately, our costs are going to continue to go up. That will affect consumers. That will affect us as patients, as, as someone buying health insurance. That will also affect the providers. Their costs will be going up as well. The cost to go to the doctor will be going up. That will affect the insurance company because they will then have to raise their costs as well. But probably some wellness programs will come into play. Um, pay for performance may start looking at physicians' outcomes instead of just you go to the doctor, the doctors pay. But what kind of job is the doctor doing? So those will be some interesting things to watch as we go forward. And um, hopefully, at some point, our costs can can remain stable or come down in the U.S. healthcare.